Praise God. Praise God. Praise God for people who actually serve God um, in, in whatever capacity. And that's what church is, right? Church is all of us. Amen? Yeah. Church is not just a pastor. And I want you to change. If you have that mentality that the church is the pastor's church and he's the owner of that church, perish the thought. Everybody say, perish the thought. Perish the thought. You need to get rid of that thought from your minds because some people may consider things that way. FCF, and surely biblically, it's not supposed to be that way. And you and I are, we, God has great designs and purpose for the church. You and I are created by God and designed by God in such a way that we will advance and we, we, we are empowered to accomplish like great significant and hard, like humongous, colossal stuff and tasks that cannot be done by one person alone. That's the reason why God empowers us in the first place. We talked about that, the, the us factor and our gifts, right? But it's very important what I'm telling you because in many organizations, what happens is the leader becomes burnout and they slowly fade away and they many times resign. Other, if, if, and if they don't resign, they live a very stressful life that affects their families and many of them actually get divorced. I remember um, in, in some in, in years ago, I mean, we had a lot. We had a series of cases because of our sister-in-law Grace, that like she was under such attack that we had like one case all together at one time. But what I noticed was that those lawyers had great offices, good-looking offices. But every, I'm not saying this is true with all the lawyers, but every lawyer we, we met, we actually had, had, had worked with, every single one of them was divorced. And you'd ask them, you know, it's like the main answer they have is they don't have time. That's why I remind my kids every time, you, even if you become, even if you have your businesses, even if you have your careers, um, make sure that you have control of your time and you make the decision regarding that time. Don't overbook yourself just because you're earning, because you will be sacrificing something that's more important than money. And having said that, it's because it, it, in many organizations, that what happens. That's what happens. Somehow the bulk of the work is on the shoulder or the weight of the organization is on the shoulders of the leader, which we talked about last week. But at times it feels like they're the only one carrying the load. And that's not good. That's not good. I remember that, uh, I don't know what you think about this, but I don't know who you would consider as the GOAT. Yeah, as the GOAT, the greatest of all time in the field of basketball. Whether it's Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, or LeBron James. Okay? So, it doesn't matter what your choice is, but I remember being so impressed by this guy who was so talented, uh, he, he won two MVPs, he has won two slam dunk contests, and he has, he has records in assists, and he was breaking records and performing so good, and there were so many people all around, he became like a cultural icon all over the world, and he was being considered as one of the greats during that time, I don't know who you, I don't know if you already know who I'm talking about, right? But my frustration was with all of those accolades and how people were copying him and wearing his jerseys, he never won a championship. He just, it's like the championship ring was eluding him, it was so elusive. And in my mind I was going, poor guy, you know, he's doing so much, he's carrying the, the team on his shoulders. He's doing the best. You, you could see him really try. I mean, would you see him really try to win the championships? But he just would not get the championship. And in my mind, I was going, I was pitying him, admiring him, and pitying him at the same time. Because he, he deserves this. But in my mind, I was calculating and reasoning, he needs a team. 
It doesn't matter how great he is. It doesn't matter how good he is. You've got to build the team up. I said, I said either, either you import some of the people who are almost as good. He, it, it's hard to find somebody as good as him. Like, but import somebody who's almost as good as him to back him up. Or let the other team like, do the hard work and step up. You know, I was having that, that contention and reasoning in my mind. And sure enough, when they did that, they became champions. And they did not only become champions once, they became champions once, twice, three times, and then had a vacation from championship, and then once again became champions once, twice, three. they had two, three peats championship. And this guy I'm talking about was a guy who has received six rings, championship rings on his finger. Now guess who I'm talking about? Michael Jordan. But it did not happen until the team was built and everybody came up and stepped up. So that's the message we're talking about this morning. We talked about leaders last week. Today, when you look at what is God's design, because God designed us to achieve stuff. God designed us to achieve and fulfill the commission, this humongous commission that God has for the church of reaching the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Colossal. That's huge. That's big. But not one person could attain that. So today we're going to continue our message. But the message title series we have, uh, the message series title we have is Organized to Serve. To serve. Organized to Serve. We're now in part two. The second part of part two. So it's part two B. The concentration of part two is about leaders and teammates. Leaders and teammates. So it's one of the, one of the, the paradigms of God's design. But today, yes, last week we talked focus on leaders. Today we're going to focus on teammates. And when I say teammates again, it's like, where is that in the Bible, Pastor? I've never, I've never heard that in the Bible. I've never read that term, teammates, in the Bible. I, I refer to that this way because you'll understand later at, at the progression of our message. Okay? So let's review. Let's review because we are talking about how God is the God of order. And he wants order in his church. The church is not an organization per se, mainly an organization. We are mainly and primarily an organism, a family. But it does not mean that God did not have organization or design for organization in the church. He has a design for organization because he wants order, efficiency, and effectiveness in the church. So let's read 1 Corinthians 14, 33 and then verse 40. It says, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's temple, of the Lord's people. Okay? Is not, God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Okay? That's Him. That's His nature. As in all the congregations. So for Him, all the churches have to have, or has to have, order and peace. Okay? All the congregations. And then verse 40 he says, but everything should be done. And the way we, were, the way we basically say, the way he's saying it is, for us to have peace and, orga and, and, and organization in order, everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. So we're talking about how did God put order? What's his design? Okay. So the first one we talked about, what design? We designed the church to have an equipper ministers and learner ministers. Okay. There are equippers in the church, and we are, there are learners in the church. Everybody will pass through that. Everybody will pass through that, being an equipper and a learner. The moment we become equipped as a learner, we become equippers. Okay, so if, if you're saying to yourself right now, but pastor, I'm not equipping anybody. Well, that means to say you're being challenged today, right here, right now. I am becoming the voice of the Holy Spirit to you. <laughs> I hope you're not getting nervous. I'm becoming the voice of the Holy Spirit to you, telling you that God is calling you to be equipped and then to be an equipper. Okay, so both of those are present and ought to be present in our lives. As a churchgoer, we don't want to be churchgoers only and not follow what Jesus wants. We learn and we do. We learn and we do. Everybody say equipper. Learner. Learner. 
Okay, both of those ought to be you. Now, I am still learning. I watch a lot of videos, I read books, and I read articles. I am still learning while I am equipping you. So I have this twofold st status. Okay, I'm a learner and I'm equipper as well. Okay, so number number two, the one we started last week, the second design that he has for the church is there are leaders. It's almost, it's almost like it's almost synonymous with each other. Equipper, ministers, learner, ministers. Now we've got leaders and teammates, but we're going to focus on the leadership and the co-servanthood of each one of us. Okay, so leaders, we talked about what their tasks were and how to go about their tasks. Okay, that's what we learned. So the continuation today is this, because you know that you probably have said this, you probably heard some people say, you talked about leadership last week. But when you're talking about leadership, that's so much to be on the shoulder of one person. Especially the context we have is the church. You know, sometimes many of us look at the pastor and, and some people think that the only job of a pastor is to stand up here on Sundays and preach for about an hour or, or 30 minutes or 40 minutes. That's it. When you're very, 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 very mistaken. Can I say that? From the perspective of a person, of a person who's experienced that, if that's your mentality, change it because you want to be in the truth. Because if the only thing that you think about the pastor doing is preach on a Sunday, you're very mistaken. That it needs even even if that's what I'm doing on Sunday morning, I'll preach for an hour, or thirty minutes, or between that time, it takes a lot of time to prepare the message. I'm telling you honestly, it takes a lot of time to prepare a message. And if you want to try that, join the Wednesday Bible study. Because in Wednesday Bible studies, we're actually asking people to start teaching. Okay, so they, every person who has taught would know the, need, the, the kind of preparation you would need to teach a certain subject. And if you're serious about it, you know that it will take more time in preparation okay, for you to be more effective and for you to actually hear from God and for you to deliver the message effectively and efficiently as well. You're going to need a lot of time in preparing that. And some people may say, oh, you know what, I'm going to go to chat GPT and type, say something about leadership. And then you just read it to the audio. If that's, if that's the kind of teacher you want to be, then it, it, it probably takes you like four, four minutes. Type whatever chat GPT tells you and then print it out and then read it to the congregation. But that's, that's not the training that we're having. The reason why we have in training is so that you do things properly, effectively and appropriately. Okay, so, yes, we have a pastor and a leader, but we know and you know that one person or a group of people, a small group of people, will not be able to accomplish the colossal task that God has entrusted for each congregation and then the church in general, or so, the universal church. So what is God's design? Because God doesn't want the church to be a failure. God doesn't want the church to operate in a way that makes organizations in the world a failure as well. So how did God design it? The second design that He has is this, is to put with the leader certain groups of people called teammates. Teammates, okay, so I'm gonna explain that to you uh, clearer right now. It's like, okay, it, it's a good concept pastor, but is that in the Bible? Is that in the Bible? Let me assure you right away. What I preach to you, every time I preach to you, unless I say it's an illustration or story, it is in the Bible. And I'll prove that to you, okay? Everybody go turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. I'll give it a little time. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Okay, let me read to you what it says. It says, Paul and Timothy. You know what? Those of you who have your NIVs, I was made to, I was made aware that sometimes I'm reading my NIV and you're reading your NIV and I'm reading something different. Anybody else notice that? Yeah. You did. Okay, so I probably have a very old NIV. I probably have the 1984 edition. I probably have 1984 edition when it was still an anointed version. Just kidding, just kidding. I probably have the 1984 version, but I'm going to buy a new one, so we're in uniform. Okay, but 
This is what it says when my NIV <laughs> in my NIV it says Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. See, I saw already something different there. Okay. So it says, it says to all the saints in Christ Jesus. In your NIV, I think it says to all God's people. Yeah? Okay. Oh, to all the saints. Okay, so, all right. Huh? To all the saints. Anybody has an NIV that says all God's people? You got all God's people. See, so some of you have the same. Yeah, really? So, okay. But they, but they, mean, they mean the same. All right, they mean the same. But what, what, I know, what I want you to notice is look, if you look at this verse, there are three groups of people that you see in that verse. Okay? The first one says saints. The next one is overseers. And then we're introduced to another group of people called deacons. Okay, deacons. So if you look at, if you look at the saints, that's the people that ought to be ministered to and are learning and are preparing to equip other people as well. So that's the saints. Over the saints, God has to take care of the saints. He has overseers. Overseers, bishops, pastors, they're all one and the same. And they're there to guide, to govern, to watch over, to guard, and then to oversee, uh, and to equip in the church, the saints. So we got overseers, and we've got the saints. But we notice again, that just those tasks I mentioned, and even repeat everything, like to guard, to govern, to equip, to watch over, to guide, to teach. Like all of those, those are not easy tasks. Those are not easy tasks. Especially when it's multiplied to a number of people. Do you know, do you know how hard it is to take care of one person? You know how hard it is to take care of one person? You know how hard it is in the church to take care of one church of, of one of one member. I remember a story about a pastor. We were just talking about it. My wife reminded me about it like a few days ago. And she goes, "Ma, do you remember the story about this?" I said, "Yeah, there's a story. I, I think I, I remembered it and shared it to you. Like there was a pastor. Like somebody died in their family, not in the pastor's family, another person's family, and then they brought it to the embalming place or were they were they." Cremate people or mom people, and then the worker there like got a chance to talk to the other guy, and then the other guy said, "What did you used to do before?" And the pastor said, and then when the guy said, the guy said, uh, "I used to be a pastor," and then now you're doing this, you're not pastoring anymore. He gave up after 20, 30 years of pastoring. I give up. And he goes, "What's the difference?" And he goes, "Here, you lay people down and straighten them up. They stay straight." In the church, you straighten people and they just keep getting crooked. He <laughs> said, that's the reason why I became a pastor again. Okay? So this light moment for all of us, okay? But, but, but I told you that the concept of teammates is in the Bible. Where did you see that pastor? Can anybody guess from that verse that we actually saw? Can anybody guess what the concept, or the concept of teammate is found? Where? In that verse that we saw? Together. Together? Okay, but we saw... That's a good, that's a, that's a good uh, guess there, man. Okay, but well, concept of teammate. You probably will not be able to guess. Deacon. The third group of people, deacons, speak of what I'm talking about. Deacons, when I look at the dictionary, Bible dictionary, this is how it's, it's defined. Okay, listen carefully. The obsolete definition. So you give you, it gives you an overview, like a rough overview of, of what it is. But there may be confusing parts here. I'm going to explain to you why it may sound confusing, but it really is not if it's explained to you. Okay, so the deacon, the obsolete understanding means to run on errands. To run on errands. So somebody who runs errands, right? So right away, you're thinking there about a, a person who's helping someone. Okay, to run errands. Modern context in that time, okay, when they use this, it speaks of an attendant. Somebody who's an attendant, who's an attendant that is generally applying to waiters. Okay, a waiter at a table, 
or in other menial duties. So when you say attended, it's serving. Okay? And here, you, you notice the word menial duties. What do you mean by menial duties? Menial. Come on. We got English. Uh, we got English. What do you call this? Um, uh, graduates here. Like English in college. What, what is menial? To like, a little not, it's not as important as others, right? It's not as big as others. It's not as significant as others. So right here we see like the deacons were being in charge of things that are not as important as others, not as weighty as others, not as heavy or well, what do you call this, consequential as other, uh, other tasks. Okay? And then it goes specifically, when you're talking about waiting or attending, serving, at tables or in other media duties, specifically deacons refer to a Christian teacher and pastor. Okay? So you now you see an office of a pastor being said to be a deacon as well, or a deacon being a pastor as well. Technically a deacon, okay? Which means, in, in a straightforward manner, which means minister, again a deacon, the original word means deacon, minister or servant, okay? Deacon, minister or servant. So I just want to refer to them, when, you, when that is explained to you, I like to refer to them as co-ministers. So I am a minister as a pastor, deacons are co-ministers or co-servants, thus the term teammates. Okay, got it? Got it? Got it. Right, okay, so co-ministers, co-servants, and teammates. Now, some people would say that the reason why organizations are having a hard time, like the boss, and it happened to me, especially in the early years of my ministry in this church, like the bosses or the leaders would rather do things all by themselves rather than delegate. Because what happens when you delegate? When you delegate a task, be prepared to expect a low class job compared to how you do things. A lower class job than how you do things when you delegate something. Okay? So it's something that if, if they don't, praise God. Hallelujah. If they do better than you, praise God. You let them do the job. You let them keep on doing that, especially if they're doing better. But a lot of times, you're a person who would measure everything. Right? Put it up. You measure everything. You delegate it, they go, uh, all right, right, look. That's it, nail it, right? And they nail it and then put the TV on and they go, yeah, boom. You expect that when you delegate something. Okay, so, but people have a hard time delegating things. So, leaders in their companies, even pastors in churches, may have a hard time delegating things because they don't trust the person's skills. Skills. Or they don't trust the person's ability. Or, more importantly, they don't trust the person's character and conduct or attitude. That's why they don't want to do it. Right? Especially in church. How could I delegate something that we don't trust the attitudes of people uh, or the characters of people? Okay? And it's something that's very important. But God answered that. God provided a design. Again, the design is for the church answers those concerns of people. So how did God address that concern? He goes, okay, look at the definition that I gave you. Menial, not as important, but specifically a deacon or a pastor or a teacher. The picture that I'm seeing here, even in the things that I read about and I was studying this, other people's perspective as well, coincides with what I have, and that is the understanding that I have is, it may be the task that the deacons or the teammates have is not as significant or as important as what the pastor has, but it's so close to the pastor's task and the pastor's character and the pastor's attitudes. Are you following? The task may be a little different, but the character of that person or the task that the person has is very close to what the pastor does and the character is very close to the pastor. Or do you see that in the Bible, pastor? Okay, remember, ministers, 
teammates, co-servants, okay, co-ministers. I want us to turn to 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 13. And by the way, while I'm preaching about deacons, that's all you. Okay? That's all you. All you. But why did I say that? Because, okay, deacons, we'll read this first and I'll explain later. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 3, 8 through 13. 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. This is what it says. Deacons, likewise, are to be men worthy of respect. Now listen, listen, this is deacon, this is the teammate. Everybody say, everybody say, that's me. That's me. Okay, everybody say it again. That's me. That's me. Okay. In the general sense of the word deacon. Okay. Now this is what it says now. Deacons, likewise, are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives are to be women worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be the husband of one wife and must manage his children and his household, and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, so what we notice here is that the, verse, the verses that we read applies to deacons, right? But the verses we read talks about the qualifications of a deacon. Okay, now this is in the context of the church. So remember again, the meaning of the word deacon is directly minister or servant. That applies to all of us. But then there's a specific group of people who are called deacons. So deaconship applies to everybody, but there is also something I believe in this verse re referring to an office of a deacon. Okay? It's referring to an office of a deacon. Much the same as everybody in the church is called to be evangelizing. Right? We're called to be evangelists, evangelizing. But there is an office of evangelist. So you see the difference there? Yeah. Everybody's called to the task of evangelism, but there's an office of evangelist. Everybody's called to the task of deaconing, serving, but there's an office of a deacon. And if you notice, the qualifications of a deacon are almost the same because because you see that, that there are also like descriptions of the qualifications of an elder. If you look at the qualifications of a deacon here, they're almost exactly the same as the qualifications of an elder. So what is he talking about? The character of the deacons in the office of deaconship should be almost very close to the character in the spirituality of the shepherd, of the elder. Okay, so you see that there. Okay? And sometimes people are going to go, but pastor, you know what? While you're reading it, I noticed something that's very limiting. You know, I want to serve. Like, imagine a girl talking, right? Imagine a girl talking. Like, I want to serve, but it says there, deacons likewise are to be men worthy of respect. They ought to be men. Okay? A deacon in verse 12 must be the husband of one wife. He must manage his children and us all well. It's not only once, but I've been asked this probably a couple of times or more. Does it mean, pastor, that deacons ought to be, or the people that serve in the church, ought to be only men? Well, the direct answer to that is not. Whatever it confirms, whenever the Bible affirms something, doesn't mean the opposite is always true. Oh, also, also always true. Because... If you, if you see it that way, if you, if you try to interpret it, to interpret this in that kind of paradigm of interpretation, then that means to say also that you have to submit a more limiting qualification here. Verse 12 says, a deacon must be the husband of but one wife and must manage his children in his household well. It doesn't mean to say you cannot be a deacon unless you have children. Right? So it doesn't pass the scrutiny, like a practical application of this. Okay, so 
That's, that's basically the design of God for the church to flow smoothly and accomplish the humongous task that it has given the church with the empowerment he gives and the design that he has created for the church. I'll give you an example. In the Bible, there's an example regarding this, okay? I want you to turn to Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7. Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7. So, but don't forget what I said a while ago. There is an office of a deacon, and there is what we call the general application of a deacon. So, all of us qualify for the general qualification of a deacon, which only means, basically means we are all co-servants. That's the design of God. We have a leader, but we're all co-servants. There was a Michael Jordan, and there's the Bulls, where he is a part of. I'm not suggesting that I'm a la Michael Jordan here, right? What was that? What was that? What was that? Oh, nobody knows? Okay. If I'm a Pentecostal, I'm going to go demon, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. All right. So let's go to Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7. Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7. Okay, let's read. This is what he says. I want you to understand what we're reading here because this is a very good example of how the church started like this teammate mentality here. Okay? In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose the seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, <laughs> Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now, it's so full of truths that I'm so tempted to talk about uh, in detail, but I'm going to skip those details. And just go to like the application here regarding what we're talking about. This is probably how many of you how many of you know that there are problems in church? That's biblical too. Okay? In fact, the very first account, I believe, the very first account of a problem arising in the church is right here. Acts chapter six. What was happening is there were believers who were Jew this is the context of Jewish people. But there are what we call Hebra uh, Grecian Jews. In some NIV um, renditions, it's Hellenistic Jews. Okay, so we got we got we got Hebraic Jews and we got Grecian Jews. Grecian Jews are still Jews, Jewish people, but they've adapted to what we call the predominant culture during that time, which is Grecian culture. They speak Greek language. They abide by the Greek culture, no longer the what we call the quoting of original Hebraic Jews practices. But they all became Christians. And the problem arose because they felt that they were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And they're feeling that their widows were being overlooked okay, in the daily distribution of food. And some people suggest that the problem goes deeper than just the distribution. Some people suggest that there was a discrimination going on. Like a culture uh, discrimination or racial discrimination going on. So what the 12, letter T, if you look at your Bible, letter T, capital, it's referring, I believe, to nobody else but or no other group of people but the apostles. Judas who faced already with another person, but they were still 12 people. So they suggested that they choose seven men instead of them attending Remember, these are office ministers, apostles. These are, quote unquote, the, the fivefold ministry offices. So what they said was, choose seven men because 
He said, it would not be right for us, verse 2, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Did you hear that? The number one task of these apostles, and I believe in the churches where God has planted, the number one priority, the cardinal, the core, the major, not the menial, but the major task of the elders or of the leaders or the pastors is the Word of God and prayer. The ministry of the Word of God and prayer. That's why in verse 4 he repeats that. And we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. They did not want anything else to touch that or lessen their time spent on those two tasks. Okay, but what happened is they chose, and by the way, when they chose these people, these seven men, a lot of commentators believe that these seven men that they raised up to help in the distribution of food and to help the apostles were considered as deacons. That's why they laid their hands on them. That laying, the, laying on of hands a lot of times is symbolic of ordination. So you get ordained to an office of. So they believe that, many of the theologians believe that they were ordained in the, de in the office of deacons, which will closely work with the, the apostles, so that the apostles could concentrate on the Word of God and the ministry of prayer. And that ought to be the paradigm of our church. That ought to be the paradigm of our church. I'm not saying as a pastor I'm exempt from, but God raised up everybody in the team so that everybody will have something to do that will not take away, instead of that taking away from. I see, I could think about fixing. We have problems with our roof, right? We have problems with our roof. But I, at home, my mind keeps on working. My mind keeps on working. What do I do? I just ordered right now, we just, we just had two packs of, of ant and roach killers. I've already sprayed those roach killers outside. Okay, but it, Fill the whole can, I need more. So I'm thinking about doing that again and doing more. I'm thinking about fixing the roof. I'm watching TikTok and YouTube and how to fix the roof holes. We cannot right now, with our financial condition, we cannot change all the roofings of the church. So now I'm thinking about how to solve the, 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 the leaks on the roof. Because you see them, you see that right there if you're paying attention. If, if you really are a part of a team, if you're really part of our team, you see those things. We see that part over there dented and, and warped because of the, of, of the leak on, of, during when it was raining. We see my ceiling falling apart if you're in my office. You see that part there have, in the spot. So we all have all of those things going on. We have a dirty backyard. And, and so many things that I'm thinking about that I'll be doing. But every single one of them will take a lot of time from me. Okay? But... God has raised up people, and a lot of times, when you notice the deacons though, you notice that they were going to be serving in a distribution of food. But the qualifications that were asked was crazy. Full of the Holy Spirit. Full of fire. You know, they, they're, they're supposed to be in the Word. Like these people are spiritually mature. As I said, they ought to be very close almost to the spirituality of the pastor. That's the reason why you would notice that Stephen... The next chapter, he was not, the story of Stephen was not about him serving food. I'm sure he did. But he became basically a person who was declaring the word of God. That caused him to lose his life. So this is something that I'm telling you. If you're a deacon, it's not, don't look at it as like, oh, it's a, it's a, he's just in charge of the menial things. That's all it is. Yes, it's, it may be true, but in the Lord's sight, we're all... If we're doing the job properly, we're as faithful as each other. Okay? So listen carefully. If, if these seven men were deacons, that means to say that the very first ever martyr in Christendom was not an apostle, was not a prophet, was not an evangelist, was not a pastor, was not a teacher, was not an elder or bishop. The very first martyr of Christendom was a deacon. That says a lot to me. Okay? So don't undermine that. But I want you to notice this because 
He's calling all of us to actually become a part of the team. You're still here. I still, at times I'm going, how do I change this? At times I'm, I'm talking to church people. And while they're talking to me about FCF, they refer to it as your church. And I always, and I try to like, and I try, no, no it's, it's acceptable when I'm speaking to people like, because there are people who left our church and then I get to talk to them again. They're not a part of, another, they're not a part of another church. And they're talking to me about your church. Pastor, your church is like this. It's exactly, it still stings, it still hurts. <laughs> it still stings and hurts because they, you used to call it our church, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, but now like your church, your church. Um, but when, it's understandable, but when I'm talking to people who are attending our church on Sundays, and they refer to FCF as your church, there's a problem there, isn't that true? What do you mean that? They have not had the concept that they are part of this team. They're not a part of our team, because you ought to be a part of our team, okay? So, I'm going to show you something, that's why I said, I'm going to call you, like we were, we were practicing uh, choir the other Sunday, and there are some things that need to be done, and, and it has to be done, you have to record this song, you have to record this part, and it's like, I'm, I'm thinking about, I, would, well, I, I can do that, but it's going to take a lot of time from me. But everybody's like, I don't even going, they even tease me, Pastor, yeah, you do it, you know, something like that. But in my mind, I'm going, I would love to do it, but it's going to take a lot of time. Because to give you an idea, I don't do all of these things, but majority of it, 99.9% at least, if we were able to prepare it, instead of writing it down, I just said, I'm just going to show the video of this guy referring to elders, and then what I take, what my take is on that, why I need everybody to actually function according to God's design in obedience to Him. Okay? Can you play this video? Oh no! We didn't get to prepare the video. Okay. Ah. Oh. Can we still do it now? There's no sound. Okay, but by the way, how many how many minutes did I assign there? How many minutes? About two, three, five. Five minutes. Okay, listen. This guy was talking so fast. And all he did was mention all the things that a pastor does. And it lasted them five minutes to enumerate everything that the pastor does. The only thing I think about, the only thing there that I, I, I did and I do all of them, not at the same time. It's is impossible. Five minutes of tasks. The only thing I remember that I don't apply is visiting people after hurricanes and tidal waves and tornadoes. That's the only part of the five minutes illustration or enumeration that he has about what I've done. So listen, I could counsel people, but God has raised up teammates to help me do that. It starts from that. Deacons could actually help. Deacons, that's you. And those who are in the office of the deacon, we will leave before. People would help me declare the Word of God instead of me keeping and teaching. It's happening right now in many areas. But declaring the word of God, comforting people, encouraging people, counseling people, praying for people, we can do that. Sharing the word of God outside, speaking to people, evangelizing, sharing the good news of the gospel to other people. Okay? Guiding the flock. So I don't I want people to watch everybody all at the same time, but they will get multiplied. We'll have a closer relationship with each other. We'll have a closer love for each other because we're caring for each other, guiding each other. Not just me guiding you, but everybody guiding each other. Easing the burden of the pastor. Instead of me spending 100 hours, divided to each one of you, I'll be spending one hour in counseling. Do you see the beauty of that? I can concentrate on the Word of God and prayer. Okay? So instead of me teaching every time, I, and I praise God for this. So those are the spiritual aspects. There are physical aspects. As I said, distribution of food. Preparing the sound system, and I thank God. I thank God I don't have to pay the sound the sound system. I used to prepare. I used to prepare the sound system. I used to prepare the lights. I built lights for stage. I built lights from scratch. I built 
remote control lights. You like remote control? I, I don't want to say remote control. Manual, manual switches. So that we have concerts, I will sing, and then I will go down and look and, 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 and control those lights. But all of those things. But you can help me now. We're a teammate. So my encouragement to you. Number one, if you're watching us right now. The Church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the best team you could ever become a part of. And if you're not yet a part of it, we're going to have communion. We're going to pray a prayer that, that leads you into being a part of this team, the, the family of God. Okay? And if you're a part of this team, the call is this. After communion, we're going to pray for you. We're going to invite you to prayer. And we want you to take action in this one. We want you to like, Lord, I obey. Now I understand what it is, okay? Don't see this church as my church. See this church as our church. You speak of FCF, that's my church. Okay? When you see concerns and things breaking down, don't say, don't, don't look at it, and, oh, that's a council's job. Yeah, they will help a lot. They will be me, we decide, we make decisions, hard decisions at times. But that's my building. The trash outside, that's my trash. The overgrown uh, grass, that's our overgrown grass. The financial crash of FCL, that's my financial crash. So you gotta look at everything here. So now, I'm no longer a consumer. I'm FCL, I'm no longer just a consumer. I'm a contributor. I'm no longer just a spectator. I'm a player. I'm not in a cruise ship, as in cruise, as in enjoying my life just like that. I'm in a cruise ship, as in I'm in a battleship. Like, I'm a part of the, I'm not a passenger, I'm a part of the crew. Okay? Those are things that you hear from right with Warren as well. I think it's in his book. But very beautiful picture. I'm, I'm this. We are, we're moving forward. If the church fails, it's pastors, it's pastors fault number one, but we're number two. Are you here with me? If FCF closes, it's pastors fault number one, but number two is our fault over there. If the church advances, it's pastors leadership and all together as a team. Are you here with me? You apply this not just in the church. You apply this in your company, organization, in your family. You will prosper. You will advance. You will be effective as a group, or as a family, as a corporation, as a team, as a band. With God's design is the best. Everything. The church of God is moving. Amen? Amen. The church of God is moving. The devil cannot stop it. But we've got... <laughs> we, usually when we use the word, it takes two to tango. It's in a negative sense, right? It's in a negative divorce. Oh, it took two to tango. It took, it's both their fault. You know what? In the church success, it takes two to tango. The elders and the deacons. The leaders and the teammates. That's what it is. Amen. Everybody please stand. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And if you want to be a part of the team, then... Uh, you know what? I respect your time as well. Oh, we have communion, right? Okay. I'm going to ask Abedina for you to please come up here in front. We are going to please come up. I enjoy, enjoy you praying. Um, somebody may assist you. Yeah? Okay, so for this communion, I want everybody, you know the drill already. If you, let this, if you haven't yet received Christ, even in your own homes, I said, prepare for your communion. And, and in your heart, you want to place your full dependence on Jesus for your salvation. And you want to give Jesus the driver's seat of your life. Let Him take control of your life. Then go ahead and partake this communion with us. And let us symbolize what is in your heart. And the prayer we're going to pray all together as well. So if you want, to receive Christ, but you want to affirm your faith in Him as your Lord and Savior. Either way, just come, take the symbols of His sacrifice, His body, and His blood. As we sing, you may want to come forward. We start.
Okay, so right now we're going to pray a prayer of acceptance, prayer of salvation, we call it. And those of you who have received Christ before, do this to support those doing this for the first time. If you haven't done it yet, if this is your first time, to be a part of the team, Jesus team, to be a part of God's family, pray this together with us. Yes, we support you in this prayer. Everybody just bow your heads. Pray this simple prayer. Dear Jesus, I repent of all my sins. I open my heart to you. And I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. In Jesus' name, everybody say, Amen. Amen. If you've done that, according to the Bible, you've been born again, you are saved, you have received eternal life. We'd like to welcome you into the team. We'd like to welcome you into God's family. God bless you.